next up, we'll have, I'll just call you Spot, on embracing your weird community building through fun and play. Big hand for Spot. Hi, friends. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is probably like an hour and a half talk, and I'm going to do it in 30, so hold on. Uh, um, so I want to hit some core concepts off the stop, uh, start. Um, open source is community. Hopefully this isn't shocking and surprising to anyone here. If it is, I apologize, you're in the wrong session. Um, yes, the licensing absolutely makes this possible, but the strength of open source is really in the collaborative structure. When people work together to solve problems, they generate ideas, they apply their diverse perspectives, and they build these relationships with themselves and with others, it allows us to evolve quickly. And I hope that's not controversial for folks in the room. But again, you know, I just want to put that down as a foundation so we have that as a starting point to work from. Now, the second foundational point is that communities are made of people. Despite the rise of our robot overlords, communities are still organizations of people. And this is true for any kind of community. It's not just open source that this applies to. Um, when you have communities, it's people that are telling the stories, that are sharing on social media, that are writing the blogs, that are crafting the website, that are maintaining the infrastructure, they're producing the stickers, they're balancing the budget, and they're giving the presentations. And in open source, sometimes there's code. Um, but people make it go. People are what fundamentally matters. Open source is people. Oh, oh, no, not like that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I don't, I don't, I don't mean like Soylent Green. Uh, that reference is showing my age a little bit. If you don't understand it, just Google that later. Um, or not. Uh, but I think that this is the sort of the final core concept I want to put down. And I put it in words on the slide as opposed to most of the rest of my slides, which are just cute pictures. Um, because I, I think this is important to understand. Because I think you can summarize how to grow a community in four easy steps. So the first step is to create an environment where people want to be. The second step is to encourage people to visibly participate in that community. The third is to promote the actions of your community to others. And the fourth is to invest in your community members so they stay. Now, there's a lot of overlap in those steps. <laughs> Uh, and I'm oversimplifying, to be clear. Like, this is something that, you know, you could get days and days of presentations on. But I think it provides a good framework to guide actions around community building. I use this myself when I'm building community, doing that sort of work, to say, is this work that I'm trying to do, does it meet one of these steps? And if it doesn't, then I have to question, is this the right thing? Am I spending time in the right place? Okay, I hear you thinking, but how do I actually do these things? I could give a whole talk on how to put these ideas into practice, but that's not the talk I submitted today, so I'm not gonna do that. Um, but we will revisit these items in the context of the talk that I am giving today. So just bear with me and, and trust that this makes sense. I promise it will. Now, I wanna pause here and explain a little bit about me and the things that I love. I love puzzles of all sorts, especially when they're not obviously puzzles. I like building things with Lego. But when you have a 3D printer, or eight like I do, the sky's the limit. You just start building things, and you make new things, and you hack the things that you built before, and you go in and you remix, and you make something new, and it's just, I love that. I love pinball, because I like the elegance of that intersection between hard, electronic, machine, and software, all neatly contained in a glass box that makes a lot of noise and flashes a lot of lights. I like mysteries and secrets, more specifically, I like learning about them, but I also like to laugh. I like to tell jokes. I like to be silly. I like to try to make other people laugh with me. And I know that everyone is different. I'm the only blue-haired person here as far as I know. And, but a lot of people love the same sort of things that I do. Maybe not 100% overlap, but there's, there's something. I, I feel confident that everyone saw my slide there and thought, oh yeah, I, I get that, I understand that. I, I do a little bit of that, I like that a little bit. And I, I also believe that if you put love into the universe, it comes back to you bigger and better and stronger. And if you lead with joy and kindness and decency, you will be more effective at the things you're trying to do. And so I try to embrace and share the things that make me happy and learn about the things that make other people happy and find the space 
where we overlap. And that brings me joy. And I think that's why I like open source so much, because there's so much opportunity to do that in these communities. Thank you, thank you. That's the end of my talk, now I'm done. <laughs> so um, I wanna talk a little bit about some inspiration. Um, DevConf is one of the longest running open source conferences on the planet. And uh, when I was working at Red Hat, and I was helping Fedora rethink its developer conference. They had been doing it for a couple of years, but it had really gotten stale, and a lot of people had stopped going, and as much fun as it is to go out with the same 22 people, we were like, okay, we need to fix this. We need to revisit how we're doing this. And so I looked at a lot of other open source conferences, and I looked at DevConf, and one of the things they were doing at the time, and they've since gone away from this, but at the time they were reserving an entire day out of a week's worth of activities for structured social engagements. There was no coding, there was no sprints, there was no talks, there was no workshops. It was, this is a day where all of us are going to get together and we're going to do something fun. We're gonna get on a boat, we're gonna have a meal, we're gonna play games, we're gonna do something exciting that is just intended to have everybody get to know each other a little bit better, to do something fun. And I liked that a lot, I liked that idea. I'd been to a lot of conferences that had evening events but at most of these evening events, they were trying to sell me something. And, or they were trying to hire me, which was also awkward and weird. And, and it never really ended up being fun. Like I was like sneaking in, getting my drink, hiding in the corner, hoping no one would try and recruit me. And I really wanted to think about what would it look like if you did fun and play as an intentional community building engagement? Not like as the thing that happens on the fringe, but like to build it in as a structural item. Okay, so most people like fun things. I, I, I know this isn't rocket science. Humans enjoy doing fun things. We like to play. Now, we might not all admit it. I'm sure there's somebody in the room who's like nah, 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 nah. We play in different ways, but except for the corner case grumbling in the corner who's wishing they had gone to the license compliance talk. Um, <laughs> when we play, we reduce stress. We feel more optimistic. We get a little bit smarter and then we go drinking and we kill that off. But having fun together grows communities. This is a very logical extension of everything I've been talking about. When you have fun with someone else, you stop thinking of them as a stranger and you start thinking of them as a friend. The places where you have fun, where you make friends, you generate positive feelings about those places. And I think this works for communities, so it works for open source. The people that you work with that you like are a lot harder to say nasty things to on a mailing list. <laughs> You're a lot less likely to be like, I hate all of the code and I hate you and I hate your whole family if you played a board game with that person and you had fun. Now, if they beat you at the board game, that's a different story. No, I'm just kidding. But, but let's go back to our steps, the ones I talked about earlier. If the clicker works, did it die? Did it die? Okay, good. All right. So step one, create an environment where people want to be. If your community has opportunities for fun and play, I really think that's gonna be a community that people are gonna be more attracted to. I mean, think about this with your marketing hat on. Which community would you like to join? One, which has a web page dedicated to the many JSON files that need to be written, or one that's got some pictures of the people in the community doing something fun, or silly, or weird, or exciting, riding a roller coaster, hanging out and laughing, playing a game, writing all the necessary JSON. I mean, it's not, again, it's not rocket science, but you look at the average open source project and you don't see that. You see the list of the JSON files that need to be written on the main website. It's hard for that to be a place where I want to stick, where I want to stay, where I want to get pumped. And okay, if, if anybody in the room is super pumped about JSON, I'm really sorry. I just picked something randomly out of the tech sphere that we live in, and, and I'm not trying to hate on it. But... But most people don't get really excited about the thing. They get excited about the thing plus the people who were nice to me, the way I was able to interact, the respect that I got from doing the work, the appreciation, the relationships, all of that makes it stick. Now I wanna be clear. I'm not saying try to fake the project as a fun thing. Lots of open source projects are complicated and they're hard. And the idea is not to pretend that the project work itself is going to be fun. Who wants to bug triage? 
That's not what I'm saying here. Like, that's not it. I'm not trying to say we're going to pretend that these things that are challenging and time-consuming and complicated, even if they're necessary. Now, some people, that's how they're wired. They get really excited about fixing bugs, and they get that adrenaline hit from doing it, and they would legitimately say that was the best fun part of contributing to this open source project was doing that work. But most of us are not wired that way. Now, again, much of what moves a project forward is the hard work. Apache calls this chopping wood and carrying water. But the idea is to take that necessary work, the hard, the ugly, the dirty, the people moving dead trees and digging in a hole, and add those intentional opportunities for fun and play. And again, if you look at these sorts of successful efforts, community cleanups, when the cleanup work is done, a lot of times this group will go out to a bar. This group will go do something to relax, to de-stress, to have fun. It's a logical connection, because otherwise, how are we going to convince people to come back out and do it again? Click. All right, second step. Encourage people to visibly participate in the community. Now, the key word here is visibly. A lot of what happens in open source happens behind the scenes. Or, I can say, backstage. You want to create opportunities for people to participate and level up their participation. Now, those opportunities and the people in those opportunities need to be visible to others. People need to be able to see themselves in the community today and tomorrow. It is critical that you go above and beyond the platform defaults that your infrastructure pieces magically gives you. It is not enough to just be accepting pull requests and call that visible participation. Yeah, it's great that that's a tool. Go beyond that. It will be worth it. Three, promote the actions of your community to others. This is called recognition. You want to put a spotlight on the positive contributions that people are making in your community, big and small. This includes everything from translations, blog posts, video tutorials, providing advice in your communication channels, even code changes. When people are recognized, they feel appreciated. When others see people being recognized, they see that that community is appreciative of the work that people are putting into the project, and they're more likely to join, participate, or level up their participation in the project. And you could do this in a fun, playful way. Now, the last one is for investing in your community members so they stay. And this overlaps with recognition, but it's bigger than that. Ask yourself, what can I do to improve the community experience so that the people who are already here stay? This could be things like improving and optimizing your workflows. It could be identifying new roles, expanding the scope of the project, expanding the scope of roles, keeping people interested. And it can also be about adding play into the mix. Now, here's where I confess my secret plan. No, it's not raccoon infestation. I'm sorry. That, that, ignore the raccoons I have in the back. Um, for the last 10 years or so, I have been actively trying to figure out a way to include things that are intentionally playful, fun, and weird into open source communities that I've been a part of, as well as across and spanning multiple communities. I want to talk about my first idea, which is this thing called badges. Now, I'm a gamer. I know the power of achievements and trophies and improving the experience for players, but they also encourage players to try different tasks and actions in the games that they might have otherwise skipped over. I mean, lots of things that we go back to get that trophy for in that game, we probably weren't going to do the first time around until we knew it was a trophy and we had to have them all. In 2012, I was the Fedora engineering manager at Red Hat, and I had my team build an infrastructure out to award badges for the positive tasks that community members were doing. Now, this turned out to be a lot harder than we thought it was going to be. Oh, wow, I got to go fast. But uh, we built a messaging bus. We wired all of our infrastructure into it. And we had an automated way of being informed when people did things. And by 2013, we had badges. Badges.fedoraproject.org is still up today. You can go check it out. It is entirely open source. 
It is Mozilla badges compatible. We added that later when Mozilla built their badges infrastructure. Um, but when I built this, I put down a few rules. Rule number one, it needs to be fun. The artwork should reflect that. It does not need to be boring and corporate. Two, it needs to be easy. You should just start getting badges for the things you're already doing. Three, collaborative. Beyond the badge code being open source, it is, people should be able to suggest new badges. It needs to go beyond code. I want people to get badges for things that aren't code work. Um, then the last thing is we should have a way to award badges manually, basically not from the message bus. This allowed us to do badges for visiting Fedora at an open source event, which turned out to be our most popular badge type. Now, I learned a couple things from doing this badges experiment. The first thing is people really like to make this joke about we don't need those stinking badges. They like to make that joke. I just accepted it and rolled with it. Um, but they also like to make new badges. Our backlog was never ideas. It was always artists. And some people don't care about badges at all. They were just like, look, I don't care. Whatever. And that's fine. People do love badge sequences, too, where you get one at five, and the next at 25, and the next at 100, and then they hit that last one, and they're like, can we get one for 10,000? I'm like, good Lord, stop. No more pull requests. But they also like competing with each other to get more and more rare badges. So I made a badge at the point, because I was the Fedora legal guy. I vetted all the licenses for Red Hat and Fedora at that time. And I made one that was just the Fedora legal badge, which you basically had to screw up something pretty bad on the licensing side, and then you get awarded that badge as an apology. And I knew several community members who actively started opening up Fedora packages looking for license problems so they could get that badge. I mean, that's not how I want to spend time, but yeah. Now, there's a couple things I wish we could have done. I had an ambitious plan here. I wanted to do like badge collections. I wanted to tie it into social networks. I wanted to extend badges to Fedora users. So if you installed Fedora, you could get badges. The known people were not into that. They were like, what are you smoking? Um, all right, next Fedora idea is the candy swap. Fedora has, at its conference, a regular tradition since 2016 where they do a candy swap as part of the conference, and they invite people, because our community is very international, to bring treats and candy from their local regions and share them with others. And it is the most fun that you can have at an open source conference is seeing this array of just incredible, weird, and delicious, and strange, and getting the opportunity to try it and having it explained. And it lets people bring their local fun culture to everybody else. It's so popular. It's such a huge hit. Also not my idea, PowerPoint karaoke. Basically the idea, if you're unfamiliar, is you get some random slide decks, and you get some volunteers who have to present to these slide decks blind, having never seen them before on auto advance. If you've got people who are willing to make fools of themselves, this is fantastic. So much laughter, so much happiness, people remember it. People still talk about the ones that other people have done at previous conferences years later. Another Fedora idea was Nest. When COVID hit and Fedora couldn't hold its in-person event, Marie Norden shifted Flock, which was Fedora's conference, to Nest and converted it into a virtual event. And we could have bought any number of off-the-shelf virtual event packages, but we built our own that had a video game look and feel. It looked like Legend of Zelda for the NES, if you're familiar with that. But it had all the Fedora references built into it. So you had this top-down viewer, and you're like walking your little character around, interacting with other people. It was very cool. We also spun up a Minecraft instance just for people to play together. It was huge. People stayed up all night building the most crazy, cool creations in Minecraft. It was amazing. Next big idea, challenge coins. Now, challenge coins originated in the military, and the military concept is like it's a ritual where you do a thing together, and you get a coin made, and you all share it, and if you, you can challenge someone to show that coin later, and it's a little bit hazing, but I didn't want to do that. I like the idea of the secret coin, but I mixed it up a bit for open source. So with the blessing of my employer, Amazon Web Services, I had a design created, and these coins were minted, and this is the front and the back of the coin here. Uh, one coin says the strongest steel is forged in the fire of a dumpster, and the other side says open source and has a firefighter on it. And anyone who's done community work in open source knows how true both these sides are. Um, and then I went on social media, and I put the word out that I've got secret swag. It's this coin right here. I put pictures up. And if you come up to me and you tell me an open source story, or you give me something cool in trade where I am the arbiter of cool, and I was really loose about it, then I will give you one of these coins. And then I went to a very popular open source conference. I told people where I was going to be, and I waited, 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 and I waited. And a couple hours later, somebody finally came by, and they said, this has got to be a prank, right? You're not really doing this. And I said, no, I am legitimately doing this. Tell me a story. Give me something in trade. I will give it to you. 
they were thrilled, put their picture up on social, and then people started trickling in as the conference got busier and busier. After that, it got a lot easier to do this. I'd go to an event, people would be like, you're the coin guy. I would post about it, but people would see me coming in. They'd be like, dude, coins. People were coming up to the Amazon Web Services booth and being like, I don't want your swag. Where's the coin guy? <laughs> I met so many cool people as part of this little experiment, and I consider it a pretty big success. I'm going to make a new coin. I'm all out of that coin. I'm sorry. Um, and a lot of other people saw this, and they were like, I'm going to make coins too. So a lot of people ended up making coins. Take that, Web3. Um, I like being playful, if it's not clear from this. Um, so I created a scavenger hunt to run out of the AWS booth. It took a while to convince the company this was a good thing, but they finally were like, we trust you. We're uh, hoping you don't do bad things. So what I basically did is I, I've been watching a lot of Taskmaster, and I put together a scavenger hunt, like an epic one, where you know I said, basically, look, I'm going to come up with a bunch of crazy ideas, and I'm going to make people do some silly things. Nothing offensive, nothing unreasonable, all often. But let them have some fun and see who will bite on this. Let's see who will be weird with me. So we put up some signage in the booth to make it clear that you could get this app that was in the Android and the iPhone store, and you could put it in, and it would have all the tasks, and you get points for various tasks. Um, and then by midday of day one, the conference was two days long, we had some people, and they were looking at it, they were like, oh, I can do this. I can do some of this, yeah. So people started doing some of the weird tasks. One of the tasks was sing a song for 30 seconds. I'll cue it up on my laptop, and you just come and karaoke it. So somebody comes over and they sing, you know, do you believe in life after love? And everybody's like, what the? <laughs> what's going on over at the AWS booth? Did they hit the, the drinking already? It's a little early for that. But people started coming over. What's going on over here? What's, what, you're having fun. <laughs> Are you allowed to do that at a, at a tech conference? And so, you know, they come over and they see, they start, oh, I can play this game. There's points and there's prizes. Oh, all right. We got some good prizes. We got some good Lego. Again, overlapping with what I like. I figure, oh, well, we get some good nice Lego sets, people will do this. Now, I did let the conference know I was going to do this. And if they'd been like, no spot, no, I wouldn't have done it. But they were on board with it. They were like, this is cool. So second day, I'm the first person in to go set up the booth. There's a line of 12 people waiting to do tasks. <laughs> they snuck in early. <laughs> and when it was done, we had 35 players that were actively competing against each other to do these tasks. But this is the best part. At the end, the winner told me she wasn't sure if she wanted to come to this conference. She didn't know anybody in this space beforehand, and she was very shy. But she saw the scavenger hunt, and she said, you know what? That sounds fun. I can be brave. I can do that. And before long, she was embracing her weird, but she'd gone beyond that, and she had like, recruited other random strangers that she had never met before, and they were like a team. They were like doing the Macarena together to get points for that activity. And she said, this is the best conference thing I've ever done. Are you going to do it again next year? I thought I was going to be lucky if I got five people to play my silly little scavenger hunt game. But this one winner made it all worthwhile for me. And the lessons that I learned is that people sometimes like being pulled a little bit outside their comfort zones, especially if there's a good reward at the end of it. I probably need to advertise it a little better than I did. And I need to make it crazier for next year so that people see that level going up. Now, the last big idea, I'm going to run over, so just yell at me when I do. Um, I like to sing. I am terrible at it. <laughs> if that previous share didn't Thank cue you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. Uh, but um, when I was working at Red Hat, my coworker Jenna Likens suggested once that we should take a group of computer science educators out for karaoke as an evening event. And I thought, this is the worst idea I've ever heard. And I was wrong. <laughs> they loved it. Now, they didn't want to sing in front of everybody at a bar. They wanted it to be in private and do it in private. And I let them do it in private, and they had fun because it was a safe space. So I brought it back. Now, these, not me, sorry, but there's some lovely people named David and Camilla who put their karaoke photo under CC by SA 2.0 under 2009, and I found it on Flickr, and here it is. Um, I wanted to create a safe space for karaoke, so we rent a private room, and then I wrote some rules. No peer pressure. Nobody's forced to sing. You can drink. You can not drink. That's also cool. No social media. Point of this is not to shame anyone or do anything scary. Come and go as you want and be kind because if you're mean, I'm going to kick you out. We've been doing these for about a year and a half now. 
and it has been a huge success except for once. People attended, told other friends, the word spread slowly, cautiously, but at one event, someone who was helping us find a venue, it was international and I didn't speak the language and we needed help to find a venue, they proceeded to invite a whole bunch of people. And word got out that there was a secret Amazon party. <laughs> and about 20 people plus what that room would hold showed up. <laughs> and some of them had been pre-gaming. To their credit, when I explained that we really couldn't put all these people into that one karaoke room, and I was very sorry, they took it pretty well. They rented the room next to us, and they went in there and did their own thing. But it reinforced that if you intentionally create a safe space for your community to have fun, it bonds them, it builds that community, and it just makes everything a little bit better. So it reinforced that those rules and that structure made sense for me. And I've never told anyone this before. This is the first time I've ever said that out loud, that we've been doing these things. So I want to be clear, this is not an open invite to crash our karaoke. But if you like my rules and you want to come sing with me, come talk to me later. Now, I learned a lot of things. I'm not an academic researcher. There's not a lot of regimen here. A lot of things I've just been trying and seeing what works. Uh, if anyone's looking for a research topic, I think this would be a really interesting one to do. Um, but people have bought into my weird. Like, they've done these things. They've been like, that was weird and fun, and I liked it. Maybe you're crazy, but, but I liked that. And the trick is to make them optional, not required, and to do it in an inclusive way. Think about what you can do to make it as inclusive as you possibly can. I have some wild ideas. I don't have time to read them. Um, but I have a short list of tasks for my scavenger hunt. So if you come find me after the session and you ask for one of my tasks and you do it, I will give you a pin that has the design from the open source dumpster fire coin. Thank you so, so much for listening to me ramble. Woo